Hello everyone, welcome to Audiobookish. This is an audiobook review and discussion podcast. My name is Fahed Rahman and I'm joined by Poppy Knight. Hello. And today we are doing kind of a New Year's festive special. We are mm-hmm. going to be discussing The Hogfather by Terry Pratchett. Do you want to read the blurb about the book, Poppy? Yes, so. T'was the night before Hogswatch and all through the house. Something was missing. The stockings are hanging ready. The sherry and pies are waiting by the fireplace. But where's the jolly fat man with his sack? It's not right to find death creeping down chimneys and trying to say ho, ho, ho. But someone's got to bring the little kiddies their presents, or else they might stop believing. Belief is important in Discworld, particularly on the last night of the year when the time is turning. If the real man in the red suit isn't found by morning, there won't be a morning ever again. A festive feast of darkness, jolly robins and tinsel. As they say, you'd better watch out. And the author is Terry Pratchett. Um, he was the acclaimed creator of the global best-selling Discord series, the first of which, The Colour of Magic, was published in 1983. In all, he was the author of over 50 best-selling books. His novels have been widely adopted for stage and screen, and he was the winner of multiple prizes, including the Carnegie Medal, as well as being awarded a knighthood for his services to literature. And he died in March 2015. And this version of the audiobook, it's so Penguin have decided to readapt all of Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels into kind of new, you know, the recording new versions of this. And this version of The Hogfather is read by BAFTA award winning actor Sean Clifford, with BAFTA and Golden Globe award winning actor Bill Nighy reading the footnotes, and with Peter Serafinowicz as the voice of Death. It also features a new theme tune composed by James Hannigan. Uh, so, Poppy, this was your idea. Uh, so mm-hmm. kind of tell us why you wanted to kind of discuss The Hogfather and particularly why this new version kind of appealed to you. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I know we were both really excited when we heard the announcement about these all these books being redone. And then The Hogfather has a really particular special place in my heart because I knew it through the Sky Adaptation, which... Uh, my family watched at Christmas. It's sort of the main thing that introduced me to Terry Pratchett and Discworld. So a really important thing there. Plus, I just love the story anyway. And, you know, I wouldn't rewatch it as often as I do if it weren't for that. Um, I have read the book a couple years ago and watched it many times. I hadn't heard any audio adaptation. And then with this one coming up, I was really excited for what they were going to do with it. Um, to talk to you about it and I thought it'd be really good so yeah nabbed it and thought we could release a, a little festive special and yeah even though Hogs Watch is sort of sort of a parallel to Christmas um on kind of the official Discworld calendars and stuff that I've have had one of before <laughs> it's sort of at the end of December it yeah. says it says that um Hogs Watch night is kind of the 31st and then Hogswatch is on a mythical date that uh, us in round world don't get. Yeah. Um, so I thought it would still be a really good time. Plus, it's a it, like I'm saying, I've, I've watched the film a lot, but we often don't necessarily watch it before Christmas. Often this kind of midly time between Christmas and New Year, where you still feel festive, but it's it's not the run up to Christmas and it's, it's that kind of middly time. I think it's a really good thing to have in that time, whether you're reading it, listening to it, watching it, whatever. It's a good story to keep you in that festive spirit. You can reflect on how the holidays have been, all sorts of stuff. It's just really good. So uh, we did previous review another Terry Pratchett book, mm. which we weren't too hot on. Um, have you listened to any of the other Discworld audio books? I think they're usually read by Tony... Robinson, I think that's his name. Yeah, I haven't actually, no. Um, partly because I have a really, really beautiful hardback ones yeah. um, that are the Joe McLaurin cover designs. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Which, yeah, yeah I yeah, love and sort yeah. of collected from the yeah. start. Um, I sent a little kind of fan message on Facebook to him just <laughs> years ago saying how much I really loved the designs because I do I think they're incredible incredible designs kind of line drawings it's it's just magical it's an amazing style and it looks so good on these on these books um and yeah and he was really touched by me having said that and he asked me which one my favorite was and then he sent me a copy of it oh that's lovely it signed I know so that's amazing so yes so partly the reason why I've more gone 
physical printed word with the Terry Pratchett's is partly because I want to read those hardbacks because yeah. um, I, I, I love them so much. And I also, yeah, I wasn't sure about the audio. I've heard mixed reviews, which obviously it does happen with everything and certainly yeah. popular things. Um, so I wasn't sure. And because a good amount of them are, are quite old, which doesn't necessarily mean they're bad, but, you know, audio was, has progressed so much since then and kind of the effort and production power that's put into them as well. Yeah. So I've, I've, I mean, I kind of got mixed feelings on on the ones that I have listened to. I think mm-hmm. the ones with Tony are fine. I don't think he's especially elevates mm. the, the the material. I mean, he's got great comic timing. The yeah. one thing that does annoy me slightly is that he kind of gives some of the characters kind of Lancashire accents when, like, in my head, like in what's my wrong head, with a Lancashire accent? <laughs> I, I, it, like, just in my head, kind of like. The, the characters in Ack Morpool is kind of like a, an urban city. And like for me, they should sound like they're more for kind of like an more an industrial kind of like sounding voice, like maybe like Manchester or um, Liverpool or something like that. And yes, yeah, mm-hmm. so that for me is just kind of that, that little bit of a disconnect. But let's, let's talk about this version of Hogfather. So as soon as I pressed play, I just had a massive smile on my face. Oh, it's, yeah. oh this is just like lovely and cozy and just kind of like just settling in. Um, so uh, uh-huh. most of the narration is done by Sean Clifford. I think mm-hmm. her performance is, on the whole, uh, amazing. She's, she's got really uh, a really beautiful voice, and she kind of narrates uh, the action really, really well. Um, mm-hmm. So, just kind of, what you, were your were your first impressions when you kind of hit hit play? Yeah, um, the first thing hitting play is what you mentioned at the end of your description is about the original music, yeah. which is really fantastic and just sets the atmosphere perfectly. Um, and it's, yeah, it's it's sort of got different sections with different moods in it playing. It's quite a long piece, but I think it's really, really good. It really puts you in the right um, zone. I sort of felt... Uh, kind of a bit of a crossover with an earlier one but if people have watched the BBC His Dark Materials the opening credit theme to that it has a similar sort of feel to that <laughs> I'd written down in my notes it's sort of like that crossed with Star Wars and then goes <laughs> to like fairy and fun um, and then a bit mischievous and there's jingle bells all Christmassy and then it goes really dramatic again um, so yeah and like I'd let people off if they said it was too long I could understand that, but I disagree and I, I loved it. Um, and yeah, different themes and emotions and facets that you feel throughout the book are sort of encapsulated in that theme, which I just thought was, yeah, incredible. And so then, yeah, Sean, I, I have written down here that I felt like she was a bit angry at the start. It sort of seemed more aggressive than I have it. Now, again, this is very much coming from the fact that I know this story from the Sky adaptation, yeah. which is very close to the book, so much so in like actual words a lot of the time. And this bit specifically, you do have a narrator that reads out this beginning part and he has a very low, calm voice. And so that is just ingrained in my head. So that's perhaps why I didn't gel as well with this. But yeah, she seemed kind of angry and shouty about it which I wasn't super sure about and all of these criticisms throughout this whole episode if I have any criticisms it is all from a place of you know this is a discussion podcast it's an opinion thing yeah and I want to set out straight that I think it is incredible so I hope if anyone who was at all involved in this does end up listening to this please do not be offended by anything <laughs> I criticize about um it is just kind of an opiniony thing and seeing what what you think and stuff like that but um yeah and a bit like you were saying with accent, she was very RP um, yeah. in the narration, which is fair and it, it is a fair enough decision, but it, it does feel quite different to what I think of. And it's not saying I have a particular like regional accent or whatever, but that kind of posh harshness sort of jarred with me a little bit. But when she was being more kind of from Susan's perspective, I felt that worked really well. I yeah. felt she was sort of a Susan kind of narrator, um, which was kind of cool. And almost all of her character voices, I absolutely loved. There were a couple I found a little bit grating and didn't yeah. really enjoy, but almost all of them I thought were fantastic. And I did think it was interesting how, you know, I don't know if this is coincidence or research or whatever, but how some of them really did sound like the voices from the Sky adaptation. Oh, um, that's interesting. Some of them, yeah, yeah, some of them were super, super similar, but in a really nice way. Um, so yeah, I do think she did a fantastic 
job. Some things weren't read how I hear them in my head, but that's fair enough. Um, yeah. And yeah, but definitely a lot of emotion and performance in there. And yeah, nice. Yeah. and so I think yeah. it's one of those things kind of like there's, you have to kind of judge these things on their own kind of like merits, but it's really difficult to separate the different versions. Kind of like there's a sky mm-hmm. version, which means a lot to you. Then there's the book version, which you've mm-hmm. got, you know, you narrate in your own head in a particular yeah. voice. And then there's this interpretation of the text as mm-hmm. well. It's interesting. You say you found her voice a bit harsh. I didn't, maybe it's because I'm from London. I didn't really <laughs> get that intonation from there, but I, yeah, I've, I wouldn't necessarily as harsh, um, harsh, yeah, it was kind yeah. of, especially the angry part, it was sort of at, at the beginning talking about the different, uh, different theories about how the world was created mm. and stuff like that. And so I won't be able to do very good impressions, yeah. but kind of how I read it when I read the print book, but because I'm inspired by the Sky adaptation, is much looser, much lighter, um, mm. and kind of like the line where it's like, and there's another theory, that things just happen. What the hell? Okay. Um, kind of thing people do a better performance yeah. than that. it's not a good <laughs> performance but that sort of tone yeah. whereas hers was like it was more angry it was more like this scholar who thinks that was like and things just happen what the hell yeah um it, it, okay yeah again i'm not doing a great impression of it but it was that sort of thing there was more sort of yeah kind of anger aggression pacey sort of stuff to her narration i felt in certain places at least okay um that like i say i think fits with susan's kind of sharp character um, but not kind of the casual, laid back, jovial kind of, but with a little bit of cleverness and and stuff that I hear when I'm normally reading a kind of yeah. Pratchett narration. Yeah. So uh, I think it would kind of behoove us to kind of mention the two other performances course, in, yeah. in at this stage before we kind of start breaking it down the plot and the mm. and, and the theme. So Bill Nighy is kind of you know Bill Nighy kind of read it really I that for me just from like I'd I'd be interesting to hear what your mm. point of view on this and the production it did occasionally sound like he's been recorded in a broom cupboard yeah. at certain points I'm just wondering whether that's kind of like a thing where he's had to record this remotely in lockdown or something because yeah, it, it sound he his voice sounded very different to yeah where like um the other two narrators were kind of working from if that makes sense yes i'm glad that you brought this up um because yes i did think the same and obviously i don't know there could be a kind of directorial decision there of sort of so he's reading the footnotes as he's being you know terry pratchett um jotting these things down and maybe that kind of idea of making it a different room but yes i got the same impression as you in that to me it sounded like he was recorded in a different space and that it was muffled. And also the fact that this announcement came about all these books and then suddenly the Hogfather was coming out. Um, and I don't know, but you don't know if with the time sensitive nature of this particular story, yeah, you don't know mm, how yes, rushed yeah. the production will have been on this. I don't know. Yeah. They could have had it in the pipeline for ages. It could have been soiled, and this could be a complete decision to have him be more muffled. But yeah, my guess, educated guess, is that yes, I don't know if that was planned for him to be quite such a different kind of sound quality in there. Um, and it certainly, I didn't love it. But yes, can certainly forgive it if that is if that is yeah. the reasons why. And even if it was a decision, can understand that. But yes, it was a little jarring the fact that his voice quality was just so different the sound quality wasn't it yeah i think yeah it was it doesn't detract too much but it's just kind mm-hmm. of like it was like just a little bit like jarring mm. kind of the rest of it's kind of like the same i don't want really to say smooth because his performance he's got a lovely voice and yeah. stuff like that yeah, it's yeah. just kind of you can just kind of tell there's a different yeah anyway um yeah and And i thought it was odd because i didn't know how i would feel about the fact that someone else was doing the footnotes because kind of when i read them in the print i I still think of them as the voice of the narrator you know what i mean like so i didn't know how i would feel about it being someone else because i'm like oh so is it not that same perspective that's telling me the story or whatever. But I actually really liked it. I surprised myself. I kind of went into it thinking, I'm not sure if I will like this. Though obviously, you know, thinking Bill Nye would do a great job, but not knowing if I would like that separation. And actually, I really quite did. Um, I think my only criticism on that was that I really loved that there was a little kind of musical twinkly sting to 
indicate that you know how do you translate footnotes into audio books that's going to be one of the most difficult things exactly so i thought they marked that really well and i think choosing a different voice is a really good idea for marking that as well um i sort of felt like the transitions though took a little bit long like oh, this is you? very very picky criticism yeah, yeah, yeah. but i sort of felt like you needed dingle dingle footnote dingle dingle you're back kind of thing whereas it seemed to be sort of dingle 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 pause footnote dingle dingle pause and you're back <laughs> you know it, it, there was a little bit of me that was just like just a little like a second a second less time would just but this is ridiculously picky but yeah, it just yeah. came out to me <laughs> yeah i think <laughs> kind, of, I thought. kind of maybe that's kind of like them filtering into kind of like bill nighy's kind of like speed of talking mm, <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe yeah as well and um i think peter as death mm. was really really good yes i, re- it, I really enjoyed it yeah, yeah 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 it made me jump when he, <laughs> when he yeah. first came yeah. into it i was sort because of, i was listening to this just like lay on my bed in the dark or whatever and and sort of yeah lay down and then suddenly <laughs> this deep low voice and yeah. yeah that made me jump a lot uh, but yeah fantastic again it's very odd that you get such a predominance of one voice and then a little bit of a completely different voice in audio, you know? You either have, like, dual narration that's pretty evenly split, or at least you know why it's split, where it's split, and stuff like that. Um, or you have full cast, or you just have one person. It's very odd to have everything, of the narration, and almost all of the character voices in one voice, and then have one character's voice by someone else. Yeah. It's sort of... And so I was concerned will this work and it it, yeah it really does apart from that initial shock where i think just the volume of his booming voice when i wasn't expecting it (laughs) made me jump i fantastic absolutely fantastic yeah Yeah, i I, I think i mean just to build on that point a little bit i think you Mm. need to kind of see this because this was when was this released kind of like 9th of december or something like that so Mm. just as you mentioned so is this the first of the the new audiobooks that's coming out must be um Mm -hmm. so i think with regards to having the you know different actors playing kind of different roles, I think we're going to have to see this as part of an overarching series. Yeah, oh, definitely. And in terms of because you know there's going to have to be that continuity through throughout all the different adaptations, mm-hmm. and I think that's one thing that I had in kind of like the the back of my head. But yeah, I think Peter hit it out of the park. Yeah, um, as Death and you know Bill Nye. It's like Bill Nye, he just does the Bill Nye thing. So it's just kind of, <laughs> it's fine. It's good. It's really it's really it's really nice. So yeah. um kind of Terry Pratchett's got this recurring theme where he goes back to kind of belief and the nature of belief. It's kind of mm. it's part of um a lot of his books, you know, especially mm-hmm. I think the first two or three that I read, belief played a really big part of it. I'm speaking specifically of small gods, um mm-hmm. pyramids and like even the first book that I read, Guards, Guards, kind of like the yeah. belief in dragons. So this is it's a recurring motif that he kind of returns to time and time again. I think this, you know, the Hogfather kind of explicitly makes clear what his views on belief are more clearly perhaps than any of his previous works. I was just wondering what you kind of felt about that. Yeah, I mean, there's so many quotable parts that people do quote a lot of the time about this and certainly kind of death speech near the end yes. to Susan. It's an iconic speech. Yeah, it's like, for yeah. sure. About how humans need to believe and why we need magic and why we need stories and things like that, which, you know, anyone who listens to this podcast, you know I love meta stuff. And yeah. it, it is this. It's talking about, well, why are fantasy books, you know, worthwhile and why are they worthwhile for adults and everything and it's it's because we do need to believe things and there's sorts of ideas of what's true and what's not what's real and what's not and yeah it's very much that just because you can say that logically something is real or not real isn't the same as believing in it you know yeah. and it, there is a real difference there and about these things of what makes us you know, conscious beings and sociable beings and just, yeah, yeah, I everything mean, he, like that. It, there's kind of, especially, it's kind of quite interesting, the difference between Death and Susan in terms of like the little lies that we, the, the little things that we ignore that aren't mm-hmm. really there. And then kind of there's these other things that we kind of create to make life a little bit smoother and fairer. Mm-hmm. Um I think that was kind of quite interesting to me. And it's kind of, yeah. So, I mean, especially, you know, deaf speech kind of at the end is, mm-hmm. 
that's I think is about as cinematic as Pratchett's gotten in his writing. Yeah, I really love how he also talks about belief and stories entwined with that throughout the ages. Yes. Kind of stuff. So this idea that the gods have evolved because we believe different things about them. They fill a different purpose and stuff like that. And the stories of the hidden people from Iceland um, and stuff, the little elves, that I have a really beautiful little book that my sister got me that has an introduction in that that really succinctly puts about how these stories came from needing to explain things like why children were going missing and why people were dying in the harsh temperatures and all sorts of stuff like that. And you find that with fairy tales across the world. That's always where fairy tales and stories come from. It's those kinds of explainings of things like that. And then you have like this, this sort of animal sacrifice is how the sun comes up kind of thing. And then even when we're like, we're talking about scientifically right or wrong, even if you go, okay, that's not that, there's another sort of belief that takes its place. There's another kind of story that that evolves into. And I thought that was really fascinating looking at that, how humanity has evolved and changed and how things like belief and stories parallel with that, which I just think is fascinating. Yeah, anyone into folklore and anything like that is a really interesting book to listen to or to read to get that those sorts of ideas flowing around yeah. as to how yeah. humanity's story and folklore and belief and everything works. Really I, good. I, I think we should probably talk a little bit about the plot to kind of just mm-hmm. put this into a little bit of context. So essentially there's this assassin. His name is Mr. Tia Taime. Uh, I think I pronounced that correctly. Uh, please uh, don't so come Tia 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 he says, yeah. Tia, yeah, Tia Taime, who's been engaged by, I think we call them the auditors of mm-hmm. the universe to basically kill the hog father and their motivations are kind of explained throughout the book but it's just it's kind of like death you know deciding to take on the hog father's role uh to p- perform this function to build up this well of belief in this character and mm-hmm. then susan trying to it, it almost works as a bit of a mystery from susan's point of view because she's not entirely sure what's going on and yeah. you know her grandfather's not telling her much and you know she's kind of it's kind of like that scene from the godfather um <laughs> where she said when i think i'm out they pull me back in <laughs> she, she, she thinks she's living a nice um human life and then you know this this event happens and uh she, she has to kind of go on this uh, adventure to find out what exactly is occurring so yeah that's kind of yeah. what the what the background of the plot is and another kind of theme that emerges as a part of that is the nature of families and how kind of Mm. you try and push away from the things that you you don't want to be a part of and then those things also bind you together as well Mm -hmm. yeah no definitely and i think there's an important thing to note here is how this is part of the discourse series and it does very much obviously pull on lightly a lot of other things across different books so sort of with you saying about family there the kind of idea that susan is the granddaughter of death the grim reaper who is a massive character throughout many 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 of the books um and yeah this personification of death and kind of not the same as but you can think of it similarly if you've read to listen to this of like death and the book thief um written from that perspective i know that was a big book for doing that um and yeah that's what terry has he has this grim reaper personification of death who looks at humanity sort of from the outside but also with some kind of vested interest in there and you have things like the assassin's guild um which is referenced in other books you have the unseen university of a load of wizards referenced in all the books and i think what's really good about it is that even though it does have these connections it really doesn't need you to know any of that yeah. You know, this this was the first one that I came to and and watching it. So they take out a lot of the detail of stuff, you know, explaining Susan's lineage and stuff like that isn't they don't really have time for, even in the three hour film. But it doesn't need you to know any of that stuff. You do pick it all up. And it is predominantly a kind of a Christmas time story. Um, you know, Hog's Watch is sort of the Discworld equivalent of Christmas. You have the Hog Father is the equivalent of Father Christmas. And so you have that kind of thing, as well as just being a fun fantasy story anyway, as well as being an assassin story. 
all sorts of things like that. It is a brilliant story in itself, yeah. even though it has all those ties to other things. I mean, it's kind of, you mentioned it's a detective story. It's a mm. assassin story. It's also kind of like a heist story as well. Mm. There's kind of elements of like Die Hard in mm. there yeah. too. Um, the ultimate uh, Christmas movie, of course. <laughs> the ultimate Christmas movie. Controversial. Uh, yeah, so it's got all these different um, elements in there. And it's like, the other thing is like, it is kind of really funny as well. Kind of mm-hmm. like, ten- yeah. yeah, I think um, there's a, a, a couple of bits. There's a kind of quite a lot of, butt humor in here <laughs> um there's uh, there's one scene in particular where the, the wizards discover a bathroom and it's kind mm. of not not so uh subtly implied that um <laughs> anyway <laughs> some, some water goes somewhere that it shouldn't and there's yeah so um i kind of quite enjoyed that as well I've, yeah it flips between really serious and really silly doesn't it yeah and he's got there's the, the thing i really like about terry pratchett's writing is that there's the full gamut of like different humors in there. there's kind mm-hmm. of this kind of like really silly stuff in there kind of like there's this butt jokes but there's also puns and there's also kind of running gags and there's also mm-hmm. um things that kind of have you know a long setup and pay off at the end and intellectual stuff and all this sort of things so there's kind of like there's something for for everyone mm-hmm. in there as well um yeah. so yeah let's Let's talk a little bit about Mr. Uh, tea Time. Um, you, you mentioned you're kind of a big fan of the TV version of the show. Mm. I think I preferred um, Sean's performance as oh. Tea Time as opposed to um, the TV version. I was just wondering what your thoughts on that were. I will strongly disagree. <laughs> um, <laughs> I absolutely love Mark Warren's performance um, in the Sky adaptation for Uh, I think he did absolutely amazingly because he has a very, very sinister, light voice that he puts on. Um, I think he's a great actor anyway. I love him in Hustle. Um, Danny Blue, my cat, who is currently hidden under my covers because he decided to get himself underneath there and has not moved, so he's now just a lump in my bed, Um, is named after Mark Warren's character in Hustle. Um, But I think he he does so good in this. It's that, it's a light kind of, childlike really really creepy voice <laughs> yeah. that he has when he does it that's sort of innocent with an edge yeah. and it just is so amazing that i just love it love it yeah. love it love it and i think it has that thing about his character where he thinks everything is a game yeah you know he he's already before he gets contracted to do this already thought of ways to inhume the hogfather because that's just how his mind works he just wants to know how would you do it how would you kill the hogfather how would you kill death how would you kill the soul cake he goes on all these lists of how would you do it? it's all just a game to him and he's a fascinating obviously quite evil but fascinating yeah. amazing amazing character and yeah i thought that the Mark Warren performance and voice really does that because he's it, there's, there's something really really sinister about him and sort of yeah I don't know the right word for it whereas I felt Sean's was more just kind of a posh boy yeah and he kind of seemed too lots of inverted quotes here but too ordinary yeah. um rather than this you know kind of thing that puts the top assassins on edge yeah. this guy you know he's re- and the the harshest you know toughest thieves in the thieves guild he really puts them on edge and yeah. he's sinister and sort of a childlike innocence but also that childlike maliciousness yeah you know i think that's the way to think of it it's sort of mentioned before about kind of a cruelty to animals kind of thing and i think that's the thing that is in sort of a lot of other things where there's kind of psychopaths and stuff like that in fiction in real life as well is that kind of that things start from that kind of do they burn an ant with a magnifying glass kind of thing yeah. i'm obviously not approving yeah. of any of that <laughs> this is very much in the realm of fiction where i love him not in the real world yeah. but it's that kind of thing he's still just that fascination of what would happen if i do this would they die maybe yeah. oh well yeah just that fascination with how things can be destroyed without thinking about the consequences and the human side of it or anything like that. That yes, I think his softer, more sinister performance is better than this. Yeah. Kind of just 
posh so, voice. Yeah. So the, the reason why I think I preferred this version you know, of this performance is that for me, the danger from the TV character was always clear. I could see that this person was a dangerous character. Mm. And with this version, I, the thing that scared me is that I don't think I would have noticed the danger I, was, I would have been in as a character in the book until it was too late. Mm. And that is what I found more scary. I think that's yeah. fair. Yeah. And I yeah. think we both think the same thing <laughs> yeah. about the two voices. Yeah. We just kind of read the character differently because yeah. I think that's sort of right that you should know <clears throat> that he's someone to fear. You know, okay. the way I read it is that he's always that. But I can totally appreciate why you think that sort of hidden sinister is better. And yeah. so kind of as a comparison to that, the going back to his dark materials, I think Mrs. Coulter should seem more innocent until you yeah. realise she's evil. Whereas I felt kind of in the TV one of that, even though I think it's an amazing performance, the nastiness is a bit more obvious. Yeah. Um, the way that they've taken that than say the book or the audio adaptation that we listen to or the film version, the Nicole Kidman one. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's that kind of distinction. Whereas, yeah, I think you should always know, in my mind, always know that he is evil okay. and scary and stuff is kind of how yeah. i and think of it i mean just kind of add another example to kind of those you mm. know, the, the perform kind of little finger from from game of thrones like the way that i read little finger is that the reason why he's such a dangerous character is that no one thinks he's the danger right, yeah, yeah so yeah. it's kind of like that uh you know that sort of thing um mm. if i've got one criticism of tea time the character and i'm not trying to cancel terry pratchett i'm really not Okay, it's not. It's just you know we have to kind of s separate these things out. Is that you know this trope of having a bad guy with a physical deformity? Completely was, agree. Yeah, yeah, it's just kind of like it's a shame that I, you know that that had to be part of the character. I think the character could have done without it. I do understand. Yeah. Like there is a bit at the end where he's particular. So he's basically got a glass eye, and mm -hmm. there's a bit at the end that kind of justifies why he's got a glass eye sort of thing in terms of one of the presents that the children receive. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I wish that kind of like hadn't been in there. I don't think it's strictly speaking necessary. Yes. No, I completely agree with you. And it is, you know, unfortunately a very common trope that a lot of people think, oh yeah, well, it's fine. It's just, that's how you know it's the villain thing. But it's the fact that people translate that into the real world. Yeah. And people think that people with disfigurements and things like that, are evil or bad or they stare at them or they're scared of them and it's just not okay it, it does have real real ramifications yeah, yeah. so yes i agree with you and disappointed about that and yeah there were a few comments throughout the not in any way to the same extent as we talked about with carpet people yeah. but that did disappoint me that those comments were in there and that i didn't love them and yeah. whatever and that as a as a large one and yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree with you i mean on that. i mean it's, i mean i'm, I'm just specifically with, with the i think that one of my so I wouldn't even say he was a friend. There's a boy that my uh, primary school, his mm -hmm. dad, well, they were refugees and his dad didn't have an eye there at all. Mm -hmm. And he was just a lovely smiling bloke that yeah. would come up and pick up his kids. So it's just, you know, it's a shame that, you know, that was exactly. there really. Yeah. No, completely agree. Completely agree. It is something that needs to be needs to be changed and that people need to realize that because the main thing you hear is people go, oh, it's just a story. And it's people need to realize that actually it's not <laughs> and yeah. that they need to kind of think about, you know, going through your everyday life, think about why do you think a certain thing is scary? You know, yeah. um, why do you think that? Well, it's because of the TV and film that you've watched, you know, and if you don't, it's a bit like, you know, that you've had because you know someone in real life that goes completely against those stereotypes. But if people don't meet people like that, then they are just being formed by TV and film and books. And if all people get are those negative stereotypes, that's all they're going to think. So it's about people, yeah, rejigging and realising that fiction is not just fiction and that tropes yeah. like that are are quite dangerous. Which kind of brings me up kind of neatly to kind of the next theme of the book, which is fear. I think fear pays quite a large role in in the mm. book i kind of i think especially the later stages i think the later stages of the book borrows quite heavily from stephen king's it in some ways kind of you know uh, this group of um burglars criminals have kind mm. of headed into the two fairies layer and the two fairies layer is kind of fighting back by producing images and creatures 
that these criminals find kind of scary. And I, I really enjoyed that section section mm. of the book. Yeah, no, same, uh, re- definitely. And it kind of links to what I was saying about that, like childlike villainy. <laughs> it's a yeah. childlike evilness. It's directly commented on in the book that just because something's for kids doesn't mean it's nice and friendly and happy. Because actually, kids' nightmares are often a lot scarier than adults' nightmares and things like that. Because you know, we kind of have more maybe kind of logic and understanding of the world of what's scary and what's not. And that even though children can be innocent in some ways, they can also have, you know, really horrible thoughts and things, even either, you know, of themselves kind of Teotima stuff or, you know, scary nightmares. And that exploring that, that childhood isn't all, you know, kind of happy, colourful kind of stuff is really interesting part of it. That, yeah, that manifestation of nightmare coming in is one of the big parts of it yeah um is there anything else that you kind of want to talk about specifically before i ask you a question yeah so sort of going a little bit more on the teotima stuff i don't have a solution to this okay yeah. but i didn't love how the narration always said tea time okay yeah because so it's, it's a major part of the book that his name is spelt t-e-a T I M E. Yeah. Um, and that people say tea time, and he gets really annoyed by that because he pronounces it Tatama. And yeah, I all, when I was reading it in print, I was always trying, despite the fact that it looks like tea time, to always sort of pronounce it more in that way when I'm reading it in my head rather than like tea time. And I was a bit disappointed that that wasn't the case. And it's sort of. This is maybe reading it a little bit too deep, but I know he's the villain. <laughs> I get yeah. that. But names are so important. Names are just such a big thing. And someone's name, their identity, and if you know, taking the time to pronounce someone's name as it's meant to be pronounced is really important. And actively not pronouncing it in that way, like Susan does. Susan yeah. actively provokes him by saying tea time, is is such a big provoking kind of act yeah. it is uh, actively aggressive against it's them. kind of a dick move really isn't it yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. so while i completely understand that in this book he is the villain and so maybe we shouldn't care if his name's disrespected but i just think yeah that how important names are it always felt really wrong to me that the narrator was pronouncing the character's name wrong and actively yeah. going against them now it's difficult because his name is said before in the narration before he says how it's pronounced and obviously this was originally written in print so that you could see the spelling yeah so i don't have a firm solution because you couldn't exactly just go oh and tea Timmer from the start and yeah. that wouldn't work yeah and then could you say tea time and then once he corrects it could you then after that have the narration say it that way i don't know i don't have a solution yeah. and that annoys me But (laughs) it was just something that really stood out. It really disappointed me because it just felt, it felt aggressive. Yeah, that did stand out to me as well a little bit. Mm. Kind of the the thing that kind of did occur to me is, oh God, what's the name of that TV show? Keeping up appearances. Have you ever seen that? No, I don't know it. Okay, so there's a family in there whose name is Bucket. Right. But uh, the the matriarch of the family is this. She she's aspiring to higher things, so she pronounces her name bouquet. I, I feel so, like so it I, rings a bell. Yeah. yeah so, I was, so in my head, that's what uh, Tia Temi was doing. Was mm. maybe trying oh, to. Okay. Maybe mm. his name is actually pronounced Tea Time. Tea Time. He's, yeah. But he's just due to the nature of the character that he's he's trying to put on the like, airs yeah. and graces um, that he doesn't deserve. Or maybe that is how his name's supposed to be pronounced, and it's an artistic decision that mm. oh that's really i genuinely with all the time that i've you know been with this story i hadn't considered that as a thing but yeah that's really interesting yeah, yeah. so um tracks cool yeah so is there anything else you kind of want to discuss oh i'm sure i mean i could talk about it forever i'm, I'm sure <laughs> yeah. there's loads of things oh sort of a little bit audio wise is apart from the footnote transition yeah. this doesn't have any sound effects Oh, which is yes. obviously a clear yeah. decision. Yeah. That. 
But the fact that it does have the footnote one sort of opens up the possibility a little bit. And I'm definitely not saying that I think it should be a sound design kind of book. I don't think it would be right to have a load of sounds throughout it. Um, I, you could, but yeah, I don't think you need to. The ones though that disappointed me, particularly because of how close they could have been to the footnotesy ones, is that sort of the blingle, blingle, blingle for when um, oh yes, <laughs> a being is created. I really thought that could have had an actual blingle, blingle. Yeah. Again, really picky stuff. And yeah. anyone who is involved in that decision making, please do not be offended whatsoever. <laughs> it's just the kind of thought that pops into my head again because I've watched the Sky One where there is a little blingle, blingle yeah. noise, and the characters also say, "Did you hear a little blingle, blingle noise?" You know. That I do think that on its own would have, without any other sound effect needed, I think that on its own would have really knocked it up yeah. another another notch, yeah. I reckon. I, it's so tricky kind of when you're designing a book like this and you know, mm. what to include and what not to include. And I think maybe there was that issue of like the time pressure yeah, maybe. as well. And we've been talking for about 40 minutes and we haven't even touched on how lovely I think the relationship between Death and Susan is and how yeah. kind of that evolves. It's a really... It's a family reunion story as well mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. So, and kind of how I really liked the way that Albert's voice and the Crow's voice to me sounded quite, kind of like quite similar in their intonation and kind of have, how I thought that's quite a clever artistic okay. decision to kind of like, because th- those two characters had kind of like a similar role in both Death and Susan's life, how they would kind mm. of like sound quite similar to each other yeah. um, and stuff. But um, the question I wanted to ask you is, can you explain the ending to me in terms of like, so there's a chase at the end, kind of like, what does that mean? Yeah, okay. <laughs> also, on endings though, this is a really funny, because despite how well I know this, it's a sort of book where you feel like the ending is there and then there's more. Yes. And then you think, oh, and this is where it ends. Oh, no, wait, there's another bit. Oh, this is where it, wait, no, there's one more <laughs> bit. Um, so yeah, and not in a bad way, but yeah. in, a, in a really weird way where sometimes I don't know that, I'm very picky when it comes to endings. Yeah. It's something that it, it, I, it is difficult for me to like. So like God's Gods, I love. I think the ending is rubbish. Um, okay. You know, and I, I, I don't know that endings always work in sort of, and Terry's ones, I don't know if I always like them. But these ones I actually do like. And I think it's yeah. weird because I think he just has like three or four really good endings um, in yeah. one book. Um, but yeah, so which specific ending? The, <laughs> the specific end. The, yeah, so yeah, mm-hmm. the, the Hogfather can you just explain to me what you think happens in that chase sequence kind of what is supposed to happen and what's what do you think the auditors are seeking to pro- i don't understand what the hog was supposed to be doing if that makes sense was it just yeah. supposed to get away is that kind of the thing that was supposed to happen well now this is very kind of <laughs> theoretically um writing an essay about it rather than definitely <laughs> saying an answer kind of thing yeah. um, and skip forward if you don't want spoilers but sort of with the way you phrased it, what's thinking in my head is that the idea is that Susan, a human or at least mostly human, protects the Hogfather and what the Hogfather stands for from the auditors. I feel like that's maybe yeah. the key thing rather than just he was meant to get away. Um, and I think sort of because it's very much shown that he is losing in that race. You know, he's not going to get away if someone doesn't intervene. And so the auditors are trying to get rid of the Hogfather because they're trying to get rid of belief and imagination and this kind of idea that they like the universe as a bunch of rocks spinning around in space um, or discs or whatever, rather than, you know, life and imagination and all that good stuff. So they're trying to get rid of the Hogfather who stands for that kind of belief and joy and happiness and yeah, suspension of disbelief sort of thing. Yeah. And Susan steps in and gets them to go away. <laughs> yeah. Basically, saves yeah. saves the Hogfather who had gone back to a sort of original form as a boar who would have been a blood sacrifice for the sun to come up. And it's like we were talking about yeah. before of yeah, how that's those kind stories of like the, changed. The entire thing I was really, I, it might help if I knew a little bit more about kind of the myth that it was based on. And that kind of, I just, that the entire sequence kind of confused me as to well, how does this idea of mercy and the sun rising kind of, I, I didn't really, it, it kind of, it was all a bit disconnected in my head. Yeah. Like, so yeah. I think a, a main thing about it is like hope for tomorrow. I okay. think so connected to the idea of, you know, if we sacrifice this boar to the gods, the sun will come up. We will have a tomorrow. It will be brighter kind of thing. 
you can sort of see how that tracks to the Hogfather coming in the night and bringing gifts and, you know, the tomorrow being better yeah. and also just that anticipation and hope in the night before, which is what you have and with that, that sacrifice. that is a, a big theme in the mm-hmm. book as well, actually, kind of how, exactly. why rich kids kind of get the presents and like yeah. the poor rich, and, you know, death is very um, upset about mm-hmm. that as well. So, yes. Yeah. So maybe that is the point that I didn't kind of get. I mean, you know, this is a book I have read and I have watched the TV show and, mm-hmm. Even after listening to the audiobook, I was still a little bit confused about that. So yeah. yeah, so maybe that, you know, that is what the kind of like the answer is there. But yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what other people think mm. about that um as well. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's that. I think it's humans defending those beliefs that they have and whether that be kind of that really old historical one, how they had to believe that they had some agency over the sun coming up and that kind of thing and and believing that you know they could make this happen things would happen there would be tomorrows and then as that sort of evolves you have you know it becomes potentially might seem more trivial and that's sort of one of the things that death talks about in his speech it kind of seems true oh you believe in a jolly fat man that brings presents but it's that idea of that things will brighten up that things will get better things will go in the future and those kind of stories and it's sort of a moment i think of the human intervening and protecting that part of life yeah and then even though he has he sort of in his hog form like dies yeah but him as a god hasn't died you know it says as an animal sacrifice he's died so many times you know you never know but then he's come back to this form that he was yeah i think it would have been really helpful i don't know if there is like a disc world version of like what the hog father myth actually is maybe that will help clear up some of my confusion i mean there's but... so many companion things and stuff like yeah, that i even I'm got sure a new that... one new one for christmas <laughs> just the other day um but yeah which i think will have some more stuff in that there's a one about the gods uh, I think it's part of the Science of Discord series, but it's oh, like the I God's one. Um, yeah, I, I, I have yeah. a lot of them that I've just yeah. not yet read. So I bet there's there's some stuff yeah. in there that's and really good. Probably some Discworld fans listening to this at the moment. They're shaking their heads. <laughs> yeah. No, they call yeah. themselves Terry <laughs> Fratchett fans. Yeah, I know. I just think one thing I wanted to add on is sort of it's connecting with that belief stuff is that one of the main mechanisms of the story and the plot and how it works is this idea about there being a finite amount of belief and what is done with belief and how it's controlled. So the whole stuff with the Tooth Fairy's Castle is about controlling belief and basically the, the way to kill the Hogfather is to stop people believing in him, uh, you know, which we've heard in lots of things and kind of like fairies and stuff like that. Is that the way to kill a god is to stop them believing in the American gods as well as another one that uses that. So that's kind of the idea there. But it's sort of talked about that they stopped believing in him, but they're not necessarily believing in anything else. And that then leaves in the magical, wonderful world that is the disc world, all this belief floating around with nowhere to go. And so the little things that people don't really believe suddenly become real. So one of my absolute favorite ones is that uh, when you do your washing, and one of your socks goes missing, (laughs) you've no idea where it is, something must have eaten it, you know? And that's a phrase that I know we've used in my house, that something must have eaten it, probably, genuinely, probably before we watch the Hogfather. Yeah. Um, Because it's just, someone must have eaten it, because it's gone, there's no way of finding it, yeah. And you don't really believe that, but you also kind of do, because there's no other explanation. (laughs) Yeah, and it's in that moment where things like the eater of socks that belief kind of concentrates itself and suddenly there actually is an eater of socks where there wasn't before, even though there are things like the personification of death and the hog father and stuff that are real in this world. Those things weren't real, but then they become real. And it's just amazing. And you have like the cheerful fairy. People joke, oh, when you're low and you need a cheerful (laughs) fairy. And incredible character that I think really, I mean, it really touched home a little bit this time when I was listening to it because the cheerful fairy can't cheer anyone up because everyone's just really miserable at the yeah. moment <laughs> yeah. and she's really sad about it and I was like wow that's um yeah that's poignant at the moment listening to that but yeah it, I think it's really fascinating his obviously his observational humor is one of the things that Terry does really well yeah. and by putting that mechanism in there he's able to do that so well in this book yeah. of what are some of the things that could explain yeah. natural phenomena yeah. that we could make into funny little characters in this like, story. Like, you know, um, one of the major characters in the book is the oh god 
of hangovers, yeah. <laughs> which is, you know, just, a, a, you know, it's not the God of hangovers, the old God of hangovers, which is just yeah. uh, a quite funny. And that pun was like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, again, kind of, it almost, there's that you know, kind of like one thing references another, you know, slightly in there kind of almost reminds me of that scene from the Ghostbusters was just like, mm-hmm. did they, you know, don't imagine. Don't think about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. About it. <laughs> like, just imagine the Snape Puff Moth Man. <laughs> it's just kind of like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 But yeah, that's, um, it's so good. And connected to that as well, one of the best characters in it is the thinking machine hex. Yes. Um, which is just wonderful. So it's sort of, because this world is kind of, certainly in this bit where this story takes place, it's kind of a, you've got a steampunky kind of thing to it. They don't have technology of like computers and stuff like we have, but they do have magic. And sort of it's that idea of magic replaces technology and what does that make kind of thing. Um, of yeah, of the thinking machine Hex, who uh, also has a, a mouse wheel as one of its parts, and you need to yeah. feed the mouse, otherwise Hex won't work. And there's the beehive. FTB, yeah, yes, there's yeah. a bee here. The <laughs> FTB needs to be enabled, uh, yeah. the fluffy teddy bear, and things like that, which I just love. And Hex's belief, you know, much like death, the kind of idea of if this, I mean, this whole thing is about yeah. inanimate objects slash things that don't exist having a human kind of a conscious form yeah uh, and a humanity to them when you wouldn't necessarily think as well as amazing puns like ant hill inside yeah. and stuff like that yeah like there's so much we, I mean, we haven't really discussed the season's character art no uh, so much but, uh, yeah this are uh, let's just get to um our recommendations i can't recommend this highly mm-hmm. enough i think it's a brilliant adaptation and if the rest of the penguin series are anything of similar quality of this mm-hmm we're in for a real treat i think yeah. it's going to be a, a really special next couple of years as these books come out so if you're a Discworld yeah, fan i can't recommend this highly enough i think it's a brilliant adaptation and if you're an audiobook fan i think this mm-hmm. is you know re- really really great performances really interesting design choices yeah as well so i don't know how you feel about it yeah completely agree um and just quickly on that to clarify like it's an adaptation as in it's been put into the audio format, but this is unabridged and, yes. you know, it is yeah. very much kind of what the text is, but read out. So yeah, which is really good. And yes, I think if you know the story already by reading it, watching it, I definitely, I do think you should listen. I think maybe you might think, oh, you know, I know that differently. That's not how I would have done it, but that's okay. <laughs> you yeah. know, it, it's okay to listen to something and to think that while you're listening to it. And I do think it's fantastic. And I think it's something where, you know, you want to reread it at this time of year, but you're really busy. You know, I'm always very much for concentrate on it, treat it like it is a physical book. Yeah. But also if you do want to be doing other things, you know, if you're driving a long way to meet up with people, you know, over this time or whatever, have an audiobook on, you can get through it quicker potentially yeah. listening to it and i think this is a really good way to do it i do think they're fantastic performances i think if you're interested in audio yeah like you say in that terms of what kind of decisions would you make it's an interesting just study anyway based on that of you know exploring it it is really really entertaining it is fabulous it does give you the story whether you're a fan already or not i think it's just an amazing story i think for people who aren't Pratchett fans either they haven't really tried it or they've tried some and don't really like it they do exist believe it or not um I think this one is really really good because it is a holiday story it has so many parallels to our life it's just a great story in itself even though there are connections it is fabulous on its own it sounds great I love it. You should definitely listen. God, I haven't even really talked about Corporal Nobby Knobs. Okay. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, please you know, give this a try if you haven't listened to or read any Discworld books before. Mm-hmm. You know, like Poppy said, you don't really need to understand the full mythos to kind of enjoy yeah. this one. So thanks for listening, guys. We, I think both of us want to wish everyone a really mm-hmm. peaceful and successful and lovely 2022 I think yeah. 2021 and the year before that were both quite difficult years for everyone so let's mm-hmm. um you know let's uh hope the next year is going to be a lot more pleasant um mm-hmm. we wish you peace and happiness and health 
and all that stuff. And thank you again for listening and supporting the podcast. You can mm-hmm. find us on social media at audiobookishpod. And if you want to email us, you can email at audiobookishpod at gmail.com. Uh, any closing words, Poppy? No, I think if I start, I will just go on another tirade about <laughs> things that we don't have time to talk about. <laughs> yeah. So no, go listen to it, uh, then go watch it, then go read it. Just all of it. Just yeah. all of it. Okay. Thanks, guys. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.